I'd like to invite on, onto the stage to join me here the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, the head of UNDP, the UN Development Program, and candidate for UN Secretary General, Helen Clark. Very nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Please have a seat. Um, you can hold that microphone. And uh, Helen, it's so great to have you here. These are all folks who are um, fascinated by the fascinating work that you do. And uh, tell us a little bit about UNDP, and then we'll talk about all the digital outreach that you're all doing. Well, thanks, and great to be here, everyone. So the last seven years, I've been at UNDP, headquartered here in New York after a very long career in public life in New Zealand, which culminated in nine years as being Prime Minister. And at the United Nations Development Program, you basically relate to uh, just about every country on earth, because either you have a program working in that country as a developing country, or it's a developed country which you look to to help fund the organization. <laughs> so I interact with the widest possible range of governments. I, I have the privilege of, of traveling to see the work we do in the most far-flung countries uh, of the world, not on the tourist map uh, uh, so often. Uh, but it, it's been incredibly satisfying work to be able to do something about uh, attacking poverty, building resilience to the huge disaster risks that are out there, and climate change, of course, is, is making that a lot worse. And then working to support people who are caught up in these appalling conflicts we, we see around our world as well. So it keeps me pretty busy. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, can you give us a sense of the scope? How many employees? How much budget do you have? How many countries are you in? That kind of thing. So we have uh, programs or projects of some kind in around 168 countries. Wow. There's an annual budget uh, of around $5 billion. We have 130 full country offices, but then sub-offices, multi-country offices, and, and so on. Uh, Full-time employees, uh, you know, it's probably in the range of 7,000, but on any one day of the week, there could be 40,000 people on a, on a uh, contract for, for UNDP. Uh, people come and go with projects. Some can be quite long running. For example, if you commit to supporting a country to develop its uh, electoral uh, a process, you might be hanging in there for two to three years to build the voter register and everything that has to be done for an election. And somewhere in the world around every two weeks, so you, there's an election going on that UNDP has been a, been a part of, uh, making happen and trying to keep as clean and as, as, as much integrity as possible. Free and Fair. Free and fair. That's right. Yes. Uh, just a reminder, folks, that your family and friends around the world can join us right now. This is being live streamed on the CUNY website. If you go to my Twitter feed, you can see I've uh, I put the link in, but also on at SMWKND. I hope you'll share it. And speaking of digital and social, uh, tell me how the UN and UNDP use uh, digital, and then we'll talk about how you use it yourself. <laughs> Well, uh, UNDP has uh, really taken to social media, and that's something I've really encouraged because I think y you don't want to be a, an inward-looking, old-fashioned organization. You have to be outward-looking. You have to uh, interact with people. So UNDP is very active on Facebook, both uh, at the headquarters, global level, but also uh, so many of the country offices, uh, many of them also on Twitter. And we encourage our people who lead our country operations, our projects, our programs, uh, all levels of, of staff to, to be involved. So if you start trying to you know, do a Twitter search on at UNDP, you, you'll come up with a tremendous amount of, of contacts. And I like to be a, an example for all this. The, the UN itself, of course, uh, has, has many sites across the different uh, parts of the organization. Right, and, and uh, one of our uh, uh, friends here is Nancy Groves, who runs at UN. In, in terms of the evolution of digital for diplomacy, for uh, for the kind of work you do. Can you compare that when you were Prime Minister, how active was the social media in New Zealand and compare it to what you see now and what is the difference? So, so we have to remember that these kinds of social media are actually pretty new. Uh, I finished being Kiwi Prime Minister at the end of 2008. Uh, I'd barely heard of Twitter or Facebook. Now, I understand the staff had set up a Facebook site, but it was all off my radar. <laughs> and Twitter was, Twitter was completely off my radar. Uh, so I came out of, of that environment where actually you know, staff tended to handle uh, the media. And I came up to New York as administrator. We had to do a lot of things for yourself 
get your message out. So I then <laughs> took to Facebook and to Twitter and, and over time have you know, built up the, well, very engaged followings, uh, shall we say. And for me, it was a way of really you know, getting feedback, seeing what people were interested in, putting up positive stories because I have the impression that people are, they really tire of all the bad news. They want to hear that something positive is happening in the world, that there is some hope out there, that good things are happening. I find that, th that the stories that really go extremely well uh, for me, uh, uh, firstly stories about women, People want to see women on the move, women doing interesting things, women engaged, empowered uh, in the economy, in the political system, whatever. They want to see girls having a, a chance. Uh, climate change is big, environment uh, generally is, is, is pretty big, but people are looking for positive stories about these things. They, they get weighed down and almost feel helpless as if, if all they ever see is bad news. So I like to think I'm in the good news business and in development, Every day you can get up in the morning and do something positive. So let's tell the world about it. I think you just had a great Twitter line, right? I'm in the good news business. That's mm -hmm. I'm sure some of you already uh, tweeted that. And when you set up your account uh, and you, you started using it, what, what were your early impressions of the social media space? Do you worry and do you get trolls and these other folks who trouble you? Or do they respond to the good news and you don't have bad news on your own account? Look, 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 there'll always be a, a little minority of the global population which is going to troll and be a pest. <laughs> the mute button's a great thing, isn't it, to, to not, have to, not have to see it in the feed. Uh, but uh, overwhelmingly, people engage uh, very, very constructively in, in my experience. And, and I'm sort of operating across uh, you know, the big Facebook site, uh, which is a personal site, uh, at Helen Clark UNDP on Instagram and Twitter. I've now taken to uh, at Helen for SG on Instagram and Twitter, Helen for SG on Snapchat, and that's been a new experience the, the last couple of weeks or so. <laughs> but you know, it, how are we going to engage youth if we don't use these medium? I mean, people are very excited by it. When I put the Facebook post up on my personal page about being on Snapchat, it got 473,000 hits. This is just my little effort, you know. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, the, I don't know, close to 2,000 comments. So it, it really went big, and that showed me there's, there's a hunger for this, this kind of engagement. So let's talk about Helen for SG. Mm. Um, how did you decide to throw your hat in the ring and uh, assess your, uh, the, the landscape for me? So I, I've been watching this for a while, and it, you know, Ten years ago, when the Secretary General was last chosen, I had kind friends who said, Helen, why don't you put your name in? I said, no, 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 I'm the Prime Minister of New Zealand. I've got a job to do. You know, I've got an election to win, and I, I did win uh, again in 2005 for the third time. Uh, but uh, eventually I left New Zealand politics, and I came up to the UN and got stuck into the development job. But the last two to three years particularly, there's been a lot of interest. Who will come forward for SG? So, as I see it, you know, the world has got huge, huge challenges in, in front of it. Uh, the growing inequality is still the close to 900 million people living in extreme poverty, not just poor, but extremely poor. Uh, these horrible, raging conflicts that we see on the news all the time, the environmental degradation, the climate change. UN's expected to step up, and I think that calls for a different kind of profile. Every other leader the UN has ever had came in as a reasonably low-profile diplomatic figure. I think we need a different sort of profile, someone who can engage very widely, make the UN relevant to much broader audiences, and think about the peace and security challenges in a much broader way, which I can do with a strong development background. You know, I go to some countries where the security incident map just looks so horrible, you know, terrorist attack there, terrorist attack there. Then you look, un look underneath the radar, these uh, are often countries where two-thirds of the people are under the age of 26, where there's very little opportunity that's positive. A lot of negative opportunities. You know, the bad guys <laughs> will pay a lot of money for you to be a, a terrorist or a, a criminal who traffics people or goods or, or, or drugs. There's a lot of negative options. We need positive options for, for youth. We need development. We need hope. So as I said, I'm, I'm in the hope business, the good news business, and I want to bring that into uh, addressing these root causes and drivers of the horrible conflicts that we're seeing seeing around our world. So I think I can bring some some innovation and some new ways of, of, of looking at the issues. We're going to open it up for questions in a minute. I 
look at the UN as an old power structure. You know, it's an old-fashioned institution. It's never had a female mm -hmm. head of uh, the institution. There are female administrators, such as yourself, who run agencies. First one on UNDP. It was <laughs> UNDP. And there are a few in other, other organizations. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't there been a woman head of the UN so far? I just think it's, it's uh, you know, 70 years since the UN was born. And it, it's never happened. No one's ever looked. And yet my experience as a leader, if you look for the women, you will find them. There's a ton of tal talented, qualified women out there for any job that, that you can name. And it's time to see uh, the woman having a fair shot at the, at the top jobs. So I don't think there's any excuses this time. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no excuses. Clearly, there are selectable women. I'd like to think I'm the most selectable, best candidate for the job, best choice for the Not job. Not just the best woman, but the best candidate. Best candidate for the job, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm competing on, on merit. I've never asked anyone to vote for me because I'm a woman. Obviously, I'm a woman. I'm very proud of being a woman. I, I bring women's perspectives to this. I believe I'm the best candidate for the job. That's why I've come forward. And uh, let's, let's have a merit contest. Wonderful. Let's take some questions. Jeff Jarvis, at Jeff Jarvis, is asking a question. And remember to tweet her, please. Yeah. Um, do we have a, another mic? One second. I have one. Sorry. So you don't need one, but here you are. <laughs> uh, hi, Helen. Jeff Jarvis here from here at CUNY. Um, the question I really want to ask you is what you think about Donald Trump. <laughs> I'm guessing you're not going to answer that, are you? No. Uh, so, so what I would ask is how much different, if you were running for office today with social media as it is today, how would that affect the way that you would campaign? And tied to that, at least as, as, as a woman who's been head of state, um, looking at Hillary Clinton and how uh, you might have seen yesterday there was a little uh, back and forth on Twitter with, with her and Trump, uh, how, how you would advise her to use social media running for office today? Well, I, I think if, if social media had been around in my heyday as a Kiwi politician, things would have been very different in campaigning because you were really very dependent on the, on the traditional media. You know, could you get into the newspaper? And this was really before there was a lot of online as, as, as well. Could you be on the television news? Uh, could you, you know, be on the, the morning radio shows? Now, these things are not unimportant, but there's so many other avenues to get your message out uh, now. So... I suspect that if it had been around in those years, and you know, I was Prime Minister in 2008, I, I would have had a Twitter account. I would have had a Facebook account. I would have been quite, quite busy. So it, it would have changed the, the direct inter interaction you had with the public uh, and got your message out a lot more, more broadly. I think what I've learned uh, throughout political life is the key thing for people is you have to, you have to be authentic. You have to be yourself. You know, you, you can't actually create an image and then be that image. You know, I, I have to be myself and tell my story. And uh, on the basis of what you see is what you get. Okay. Let's do a couple of questions. Jeff, would you mind? Uh, yep. yep. Happy to. Jeff, I, I said you were, like, I said some, uh, I'll, I'll be Phil Donahue, and people didn't know who that was. That's how the world has changed. <laughs> was so sad. I even have the hair for Yeah, you do, you do. Yeah. Tell us who you are, too, please. Hi, I'm Kate Sands Adams with the International Rescue Committee. And uh, organizations like mine that work in the aid and development space, we always talk about how we need to do a better job listening to the people that we assist. And what role do you see with social media tools in making that happen? I know organizations like mine are taking small steps, but I think there's much more we could be doing. Thank you. Yeah, so what, what <laughs> the word that's sort of talked about now is how, how do you involve people in co-designing initiatives uh, which would actually be useful to them? And uh, so rather than development experts sitting around uh, and saying, well, we think, you know, this is how it should be done, involve those that, to identify what, what the challenge is and how they'd like to see it met. I think that's critical. We're doing, I mean, you, you can do that in the traditional sense of, you know, sitting with the communities and exploring that, but with social media and social media laboratories and innovation labs, you can bring young people in who are very ICT savvy and get them looking at uh, at how to find solutions. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the uh, uh, social media kind of exercises labs we had in Egypt a while back 
looked at how to deal with the problem of the under-reporting of sexual and gender-based violence, which is a problem in every society, right? Women are reluctant to come forward because often if you take your case, you end up being treated as the victim and the <laughs> you, you end up being on trial in court yourself rather than the, the person who perpetrated the violence. But uh, the, the young people brainstormed and all the solutions they came up with involved social media. How would you get uh, online sites, text sites? How could people report in confidence? Would there be follow-up? So we've found that if, if you involve uh, youth, ICT, uh, say what's the significant challenge, how would you deal with it? You get incredibly innovative ideas and we're encouraging our country officers around the world to embrace innovation and, and, and bringing people in to design what would be helpful. Great, thank you. Back here, yeah. Hi, Cindy Stivers. Um, did you, and I don't know, it was early we started this morning, but did you see the New York Times had a story about Ban Ki-moon coming forward and saying that um, he was under pressure from Saudi Arabia and that he, he basically went public with some, you know, some backroom dealings, it sounded like. Um, would you, how do you reconcile this in the age of social media, which sounds like you're willing to be very transparent. Anyway, I just wanted to see what you what your reaction is to this and how you would run things. And have you seen this particular story? I've not seen it because I've been here all day, but um, even if it's not about that particular incident, if you can just talk about, because the UN, there are a lot of back deals and horse trading and all of that. Yeah, the, I mean, and obviously in diplomacy, not everything uh, you know, is on the front page of the paper. I, I have seen the story. Um, but you know, my style is to be pretty transparent about what I'm doing and how I'm handling an issue. And it, this campaign is interesting because people, people are asking a lot of very specific questions. And the truth is you don't always have the answer. But I think uh, you need to be transparent about, well, how would I handle a, a situation? And one of the points I've made is that Having, having run a government for a lot of years, I do tend to keep a very close eye on what's, what's happening uh, uh, beneath me uh, and know, have early warning systems on what's coming up and what might have to be dealt with and who you may need to engage with. And I think these jobs are a lot about uh, being able to engage very widely, have dialogue, uh, bring people together to talk something, something out and try never to be surprised. I think this is, this is very, very important. Uh, avoid surprises. Be on, sufficiently on top of things, sitting on things, not to be surprised. Just so that people can understand how the election process works, you're going to be elected by countries and their representatives at the UN. And can you talk about that? And how many countries will you visit as part of the campaign? And how is this financed? Is this a... You know, how, do, how does that, because I don't think any of us know the, these kinds of stories about this. So there's never been a semi-open process of selection for the Secretary General before. Uh, in the past, uh, it's been entirely within the UN Security Council, which has 15 members, five of them permanent. That's the United States, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom. They all have a veto uh, on any decision that goes to the Security Council, and there's 10 elected members. Uh, so this time, uh, there was a lot of demand for a more open process from civil society and also from many member states. And there is a Danish president of the General Assembly who is very, very keen on bringing as much transparency as he can to this process. So it was decided that there would be, for the first time ever, uh, hearings in the UN General Assembly of the candidates, and each candidate who announces has two hours with the General Assembly. Mine was on the 14th of April, and it's all on the General Assembly President's uh, website for those who want to see. I, took, I got 109 questions, by the way, in the two hours, and the member states were very, very uh, engaged. But from now, it becomes a Security Council process, and next month, the Security Council will, in effect, do a shortlisting of the candidates. They will vote whether to uh, encourage a candidate, discourage a candidate, or have no opinion. And if there's sort of, you know, 11 no opinions, people probably quietly drop away. Um, I hope not to be in that position, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, so uh, then, most likely July, uh, after July, you go into the August holiday break, not much happens. September's a big month at the UN, big leaders week, months, and so on. Uh, October, it's expected that there may well be a decision. So 
For me, I've been moving around Security Council capitals. I have uh, been visiting another five in the next two weeks. And I'm meeting with groups of ambassadors uh, at the UN and uh, you know, doing a lot of outreach through uh, social media. Uh, how I'm organising it? Today I am, am on leave. I'm on my annual holiday leave uh, to come and talk to you and do oh, campaign things. <laughs> and uh, everything I do in the course of the campaign is paid for by the New Zealand government. So I keep a very clear distinction between being UNDP administrator, which I have ongoing responsibilities for, uh, and, and what I do on this. So very, very transparent about that. Thank you. Let's do a question. Yes. Hi. Thank you. I'm Susan Sawyers, Susaw on Twitter. Um, I wanted to ask you, last month um, the Pew, Re Pew reported that 62% of people get their news from social media. Um, and with algorithms we get, we know we get information from our friends and from people who various sites think we should hear from. With your development goals and your understanding of root causes of problems, how do you best get your message out if we're only reading what is fed to us? Yeah, so what, what you're suggesting is that in, in a sense our, our Twitter feeds and everything we see is a bit kind of, uh, uh, shall we say, filtered. So, <laughs> But I, I think, you know, through the use of, of, of hashtags particularly, um, you can, you know, start to get a focus on on your issues. It take, takes a while, obviously, to build up the, you know, the interest and the following on, on on that. Uh, but you know, we, we we can but try to sort of break through those those sort of filters that get put around people, either because they select them or someone else uh, selects them uh, uh, for them, and, and just try and break through. And, and you know, I, I'm reasonably happy that we are we are breaking through, but you've got to work at it. We'll do one more question. Yeah. Hi, Gonzo 820. Uh, Gonzo 820. Uh, let's just cut to the chase, Ellen. What can we do for you to get oh, wow. you in there, in that position where you should be? Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in essence, spread the word, you know, uh, hashtag Helen for SG. Uh, and it's it's across uh, Snapchat and Twitter and Instagram and uh, Facebook and and many many things. After this session, uh, Donetta is going to be having a workshop in, a, in another room, and she's going to talk uh, quite a bit about this and how the the campaign is using social media as well. Uh, you know, there's some key decision makers, and uh, one of the key decision makers on this is the, uh, the the government of the United States of America, obviously, because it's a, a major <laughs> the major. Uh, world power funder of the the UN and has a huge interest in who is who is Secretary General. Uh, so anything that can be done to get the word out about you know what what civil society what the world citizens are looking for in a UN leader is incredibly helpful. All Thank right. you. Okay, so uh, we're going to uh, have to leave this here so she can get on with her day. We're so grateful you gave us some time. Uh, obviously, we're not subject to equal reporting and things like that if this was a U.S. election. But if there were any uh, um, Secretary General candidates who want to show up here in the next four hours, they're welcome. We'll debate with Helen. But in that unlikely event, we will end this here. And we want to thank Helen Clark. Thank you so much for doing this.